Hey everybody, it's Chris here for an episode of AMA and today we have two guests in the studio with us. We have two Art Center graduates, you guys just graduated, we have Michelle Fong. Did I say that right? Michelle Fong? Yeah. And Emily Shea. Emily Shea. Welcome to the show. You guys have a question, so there you guys go. Let me try this again. I want you guys to listen to me. Yeah. I design sandwiches. My name is Jose Caballet and I talk about the design of business. <laughs> the des <laughs> I talk about a lot of stuff. My name is Chris Doe and I talk about the business of design. At the center of this operating system, it's about understanding. <clears throat> Jose, can we just tell them what the show title is? I hate you, dude. You are watching The Process. So my first question was, um, as a designer, we're making a lot of work and sometimes we're not too happy with the type of work that we end up with. What would you, what's your advice on like feeling better um, about, I guess, the end result every time? <laughs> do you often find that you're disappointed in the results? Is that what you're saying? How do you prevent from being disappointed in the end results? Yeah, yeah. Like you kind of put so much effort and you have this like dream board of like inspiration or design you're like oh I have it's going to be so amazing and whether it's like time constraint or something else um, you kind of feel like oh I wish I've done better um, or at least I find that I always think that okay I think that's a great question so for me there's a couple of things I have to think about here one is design and what we do is when we make stuff we we turn abstract ideas into tangible things things that other people can look at and things that we can critique as you all know, when we have an idea in our head, whether it's about an exercise program you want to join, um, a physical thing, or like a physical thing like as a book, it's always better in your head. So it's inherent within the process of translating this kind of amorphous thing that's in your mind into something tangible that becomes a thing where you can get disappointed in the results. So my suggestion is, instead of defining the results as how closely the end result matches your vision in your head because it'll never live up to it. Nothing is ever as good as you imagine it, right? Like you wake up in the middle of the night and you have an idea for a logo and then you go to make it. It never measures up because it's not concrete. It changes in your mind so it's gonna always match up what you think. So my thing is instead of measuring whether or not the printing, the bindery, the fonts, all those kinds of things live up to your expectations, maybe we can define the end results as something a little bit different. Maybe the end result should be about how much you've grown. And maybe if you define it in terms of your own growth, then you won't be disappointed. So unless you don't really challenge yourself. And one of the things I think as designers and creative types, we have a fear that the work won't measure up and live up to what it is that we want to create. So then we stay within our comfort zone. We make things that don't really challenge us because we know we cannot fail there. But to me, then, I would be disappointed in the results. So I think it would be better for your own growth, your own development, and who you are as a designer and developing your own voice if you tried to push yourself, if you accepted that instead of measuring the success and failure project on the end result, measure it on the success and failure of how much you've grown. How much risk did you take? How far did you stretch an idea? How far did you push yourself? Does that help you? Yeah. I think something that helped a lot when we talked at my grad show was also to count what things went right as opposed to just the things that went wrong. Oh yeah. Yeah, because it's like in critique we're very used to taking in like what went wrong, what could have been better, um, but it's also important to remember to count what went right, like what did I do, what new skills did I learn, and being really like happy with that and celebrating that too. I, I love it. So. There's a balance uh, in a critique-based um, structure where if you're in school, it's, it's seemingly like our duty as peers or faculty in my case to point out the things that could be better and those things can help you. And then sometimes we forget to remember that, that has, it takes a toll on the person because it's always chipping you down. And you're totally right, I'm really glad you said that, Michelle, is for you to take credit and an accounting of what you did right, how much you've grown, you've learned a new tool, you did something you've never done before, you learned a different style, you exposed yourself to a new technique, or perhaps through your research you figured out a new tool, a new shortcut, all those things. So for me personally, like I've been doing this for so long, 20 plus years going on strong right now, and I'm as motivated and as driven as I've ever been because I do take account for all those little things that I do right and that gives me fuel to keep pushing forward. Oftentimes, Emily will know this, 
is I'll roll my eyes at her and say, Emily, why don't you know this shortcut? You just graduated. You've had instructors. You're doing this day in and day out. Why isn't it that you know how to do this? And why is it an old man like me can come and say, say to you, here's 14 shortcuts on how to do this much more efficiently? That's because I, I mess in a lot of time and I take note of how um, I can speed up my process and, and then I give myself credit for learning those new things. And those things really excite me. Emily, you have a response to that? I do. I mean, follow up. That's not pointing at me, guys. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, to follow up to that question, yeah. is all of that, what you do, does that lower the, uh, ex not expectation, but does that impress the client? Or how, will they, how would you want to not disappoint the client? How to impress them? Oh, you want to impress the client? Right. I mean, we all want to impress the clients, right? Or it's like, we impress ourselves or we become disappointed in ourselves and then how would it be on the flip side? Okay. Like, Just to paraphrase what you're saying, I may not be capturing the sentiment of your question, but how do you meet or exceed your client's expectations so that they don't become disappointed? I don't like to use the word impress because it implies I'm trying to validate what I do through them. Yeah. I know that the work is good. I know it's not good. I don't need them to tell me that. Okay, I do know if it's working or not working. So how do you not disappoint the client? One, one thing that you can do, and you got to be careful about this, is never over-promise. My motto is under-promise, over-deliver. Don't tell them you do 14 versions because that's what you did last time. Tell them that you're going to show them two versions. And then when you come in with four, you've doubled their expectations. But imagine if you promise eight, then you've met half that expectation. And they're going to say, wow, Emily, we're really underwhelmed with the work that you did. And you've set yourself up for failure in that case, and you don't want to do that, mm -hmm. okay? Um, another thing about this is, as designers, if you worked on your craft, if you understand aesthetics um, and you have good taste, generally speaking, you have better taste than your clients. So it's not going to be a matter of you having bad taste, doing something that's cheesy or trendy or any of those kinds of things. Generally speaking, that's the case. So the other way I like to think about this is how not to disappoint your clients is to not have um, a, a goal that is arbitrary, that's vague, that's subjective. Because then you get into that's the wrong shade of red, that's the wrong shade of persimmon, whatever color that is. Then it becomes wholly just opinion-based. Opinion based. Another way to do this is say, what kind of marketing goals, what kind of messaging goals, what are we trying to do with this initiative? How will we know if we succeeded or not? Now that's a, a much problem. harder question to have answered and then a much harder thing to deliver on. But if we start to elevate the conversation and move away from purely aesthetics, I think we're gonna create more value for ourselves and avoid the danger of getting to the space where the clients and us do battle over whether or not it's good enough, okay? That's a great follow-up question, but I think you have another question, right? Do I? <laughs> <laughs> um, just, what are some mistakes or advice that you would like to give recent graduates? Or not mistakes, but what kind of um, mistake have you seen people make? And what kind of advice you would like to give us? Okay. To young designers and recent graduates. Okay, so what kind of advice do I have for recent graduates and things to avoid pitfalls? I, I want to caution all of you guys this because I see it happen too often. Usually, if I like somebody's work, I ask them, what's your rate? And they don't know what their rate is. And what do they wind up saying? Let me get back to you. So they call up all their friends, they do research, and everybody starts to inflate numbers. Well, I heard Johnny does this. But what it doesn't take into consideration are two really important things. One, what is your skill level? What is it that you create relative to everybody else? Two. How big is this company? How deep are their pockets? What are they asking you to do? Is it a dangerous job? Is it a safe job? Is it a great culture, a great work environment? And those are the two things you really need to kind of sort out. This has happened, and I've spoken about this before. The most dangerous thing that you can do for yourself is overprice your skill level. Because you're gonna create friction where none existed. It's like you coming in and saying, I would do eight times the work of everybody else here and only doing two times. Now two times would be a home run. So that's the danger. Be careful how you price yourself because it's relative to what you can do and what the company can afford. A different way of phrasing that is perhaps to ask them a question back. So instead of saying, this is my price, saying, 
I would really like to work here. I have a couple other offers, but my preference would be to work here. What makes sense to you based on what it is that I do? Because I trust you. Now, when you say those kinds of words, unless the person is a total maniac, they're going to be a lot more careful. Instead of just negotiating you down, they're going to think, well, I have a responsibility here. Emily really wants to come and work with us. What price should I? Okay, I think based on what the interns are doing and what these guys are, she's somewhere in here. And then I'm going to give you the offer. And then my advice is, unless it feels like they're totally taking advantage of you, take the offer, put a time period on it, say, that sounds reasonable to me. Let's try this out for three weeks, two months, one month, whatever it is that you want to do it for. And then review at the end. Say, have I met those expectations? And you should know well in advance if you have or not. There's room to grow up and it's easy to raise your rates. It's really hard to come in, totally blow up on a job, and your reputation is all you have. And so then it leaves a bad taste in the person's mouth saying, Emily is overpriced. I overpaid for what I got and I don't want that anymore. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna start shopping for somebody else like Michelle. And say, hey Michelle, what are you doing? <laughs> right? That's what's gonna happen. So be careful about that kind of stuff. I think it's important to get feedback from who you're working for or reporting to, but think about it in terms of goals, things that you know you can achieve within that time period to see if you're meeting those things. And also be looking for other things to do. So if you're scheduled for an eight hour day, and four hours into it, you already finished your work. Don't sit there and pretend like there's nothing else to do. There is. Go ask. Be of service to the company. And you endear yourself to them. And they're going to say, wow, Emily's a real go-getter. She's going to go out and help us grow as a company. The, the old adage is, like in large corporations, is you don't want to get noticed. If you get noticed, if you're the nail that sticks out, you get smashed. There's a noisy person. That person does this. They're just a troublemaker. They're creating all problems. But I think in 21st century businesses, it's dangerous not to be noticed. You want to be noticed. You want to be seen as a person who's moving the ball forward, who's helping the company to grow, helping others to grow, and that's what you want. So if you're flying under the radar, you're going to fly yourself straight out of a job. Okay? And the other thing too is this. When you're applying for a job, when the company says yes, you have the job, don't talk yourself out of the job. When somebody says yes, this is what you need to do. That's it. You know, people will say, here's my work. I say, great, I've seen enough. Took a couple of pieces in, because I've seen enough work in my lifetime. I know what good work looks like. I only need to see three to five pieces of consistent work. I don't need to see more. Usually when I need to see more, it's because I'm unsure of your work. Okay, so when I say that's enough, you're like, well, don't you want to see portfolio piece seven, eight, nine, and 10? What's that gonna do? What if I see something in eight, nine, and 10 that I don't want? So stop trying to show me work after you got the yes. It's called going past the sale and you don't want to go past the sale. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. All right. Um, you want to voice Rashab's question for him? How not to disappoint your teammate? <laughs> Isn't that what you want? Yeah, for clients. Um, I'm pretty sure it was related to like my question, which was first like, how do you not disappoint yourself? And then I think he turned it around into like, how do you not disappoint the client? <laughs> or the team. Or the so team. My aim is more on the basis of like relations. So like how do you maintain relations? Even if you did like good work, but there's a lot of like to and fro with, with someone while doing that work, how do you maintain a good relationship with them? When with who? With the client or with like uh, the people at work. So did I answer that question already? No. So if, if you did a good work, yeah. like, during doing while doing that work, there was a lot of to and fro, right? There was like, yeah. Should we do this, should we do that? And because of that there was a little friction. Yes. So at the end of it, how do you remedy that? to make sure that you know, after you've done the work and they're happy with the work, they're still happy with you as well. Perfect. Uh, Rashab asked this question about how can you maintain a relationship so what started out really strong doesn't devolve into something horrible. It, it can break at any given moment in time. It really can. So we talk about this a lot at the company. Little mistakes, taking the client for granted, those things will kill the job every single time. And usually, also, one, one other thing, poor communication. When you have your clients calling you and asking you what's up with this project, that's bad client management, that's poor communication. If you're behind on a project, shoot them an email, call them up, let them know, and build a structure so there's visibility and transparency into the things that you're doing. How do I know where we're at? You know, maybe you are doing frequent check-ins or little status updates. Those things, the not knowing, those things bug clients. They bug me. 
So for example, Emily, I give you a job to do. If I don't hear or see from you in a while, I start to wonder, is Emily on her Facebook page, on Facebook Live broadcasting? <laughs> or is she working on my project? And the truth is, you're probably grinding away at the project day and night, all night worrying about the project, but you don't tell me. And so then, so here's the thing that I've learned too from business is that absent a narrative, people invent one. Without telling me the story of what's going on, we use our imagination, we make up a story. And usually the story's not very flattering. I'll give you an example. Aaron, every time I come into the office, I'm like, where is Aaron? Why is he at his desk? And I start to think, God, this guy never comes in on time. What is going on? Or I look for Andrew, I'm like, Andrew, <laughs> where the heck are you? Where's my edit? I don't see anybody anywhere. Do so you see what the problem is? <laughs> That's the problem. So great communication, making sure they have visibility into what you're doing and being very transparent about your process. You'll get into more trouble covering up stuff than just telling people the truth. This took me longer than I thought. I underestimated this. I'm still trying to find the perfect image and I can't find it yet. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit behind. I think I can resolve this by tomorrow. And then give yourself a little cushion. If you think it takes three hours, give yourself six hours or 12 hours. Give yourself more time. So when it appears in their inbox ahead of time, they're delighted versus past deadline, they're angry. Now, usually also where things devolve is the friction points that you're talking about, Rashab, is where you start to take the client for granted. Oh, we've done great work. Uh, they should appreciate us. No, you need to understand you exist, you have rent, you have food because somebody agreed to give you money for the things that you do. They support your livelihood, okay? Don't act like they're, you're doing them a favor by gifting them your creative genius. There are a lot of choices in the world, more so every single day, because we live in this global design community now. If you don't service them well, you're not, you're not uh, going to keep them for very long. So my business coach, Kier, he talks about this all the time. He says, no matter what kind of company you are, whether you manufacture widgets, make tacos, or do graphic design, all companies are essentially the same. All companies do marketing, and all companies are customer service companies, period. It doesn't matter if you sell shoes, purses, or your hairstylist, if you don't give great customer service, and you don't learn how to market yourself, you're gonna be out of business. It's about the customer service, and that's what makes it different. Okay, I think, you guys have any other questions? To be a philosoph. Philosophical. Yeah, if you can say it. Philosophical. Go ahead, ask your philosophical No, but like, why do people not be transparent? Like how you said, they just don't communicate with their clients, right? I mean, it's just tell the truth, right? Why don't people do that? I mean, it's... Why don't you think people do that? Why don't people, why are they afraid to tell the truth? Why? Do you know? No, I'm asking you. Why why not be the answer? I feel like they like blow it up in their heads. Like they think on it and then it gets scarier. Yeah. Maybe, and then yes. they don't say. Yeah. Great philosophical question from Emily Shea. Why are we opaque versus transparent? And it's one of confidence, really, and it's about uh, an imagined battle that happens in your head. And I think what happens is you're judging yourself so critically every time you do something that it becomes this amplification within the echo chamber of your brain. So when you think, I can't tell the clients I couldn't find the right image, they're going to think I'm a moron that I'm habitually uh, late on projects, or I, I, I'm, I'm, I think too highly of myself, whatever it is, whereas the truth will set you free. Now here's the thing, one, really, one tip that you can apply right now. If you mess up on a job, the first thing you do is diffuse the client's anger and their frustration. Just come in, hands up, I'm so sorry, I screwed up, this is my fault, I'm gonna make this right. I apologize for doing this. It's not professional. Notice how he gave no excuses. And then make it right. This is what happened. And it's my fault. That's it. And people usually looking for a fight, once you say that, they don't look for fights anymore. And even if they do, you know what? You deserve it. Let, let them lay into you for a little bit and it will diminish. The last thing you want to do is sit there and like, but this happened and then you did that. At the end of the day, you might win the battle, but you'll lose the war. Because they're going to walk away thinking, you know what? I don't ever want to work with Emily again. Or I don't want to work with Michelle. They're just a pain in the butt and they don't tell me the truth. People like the truth. So it takes some confidence to be able to speak about things in a transparent manner. This is what happened. This is why this is the case.
and that's it. And the rest of it is just kind of this fear that's happening in your head. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in on Facebook Live. Hope you got some value out of this. Katie says, I'm scary. Dang. <laughs> it's Katie, am I that scary? Can I see the comments? Yeah, you can see the comments, but here. You guys want to read them? Uh, scary. Uh, when I grow up, I want to be Christo. <laughs> <laughs> that's my son. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Guys, that's another episode of AMA. I hope you got value out of this. We're talking about some topics that we've talked about before, but I really appreciate both Michelle and Emily for being here. Thanks, guys. See you guys around.